What's going on guys? We have a little bit of a different video today. We reached out to some people that have YouTube channels that are also well respected, researched, and they're bringing you studies that they think you should know about before starting a keto diet. So these are the ones that they view as pivotal information. They're gonna talk about them, they're gonna discuss them. I'm gonna link them below, and I'm also gonna link their channels below. All of these people have YouTube channels. You can check out, subscribe, support, all that stuff. On to the studies. So if there's one study that gets me really excited when it comes to nutritional ketosis, it's this one right here. A group in Spain, what they found is that a low calorie ketogenic diet did not lead to the expected reduction in resting metabolic rate when people lost body fat. It's really important to keep this in mind because oftentimes in studies, when they have individuals go on a low calorie diet, do a lot of exercise, sure they lose weight, but what happens? Their baseline metabolic rate declines. And guess what happens? 10, 12 weeks later, they regain the weight lost plus some. And no one wants that. We don't want, that's self-defeating. That makes people think that, that they're broken, that something is wrong with them. So what this research found is that when individuals lost weight on a low calorie ketogenic style diet, they preserved free fat mass, that's muscle tissue. So muscle tissue, in addition to your thyroid hormone and your adrenaline, kind of basically comprise your body's resting metabolic rate. And so that's what's really exciting about this. And it speaks to the epigenetic and the network signaling hubs that are tinkered with with ketones. We know that beta hydroxybutyrate, it's not just like a one-to-one -one, you know, swapping glucose for ketones, it's exponential because of how ketones affect network signaling within our metabolic and immune networks within our body. So it's pretty exciting. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this short little snippet. A randomized clinical trial that ran for two years done by the Journal of diabetes, obesity, and metabolism looked at two populations over a two-year window. One was a low-carb, high-fat. The other was a high-carb, low-fat diet. So the low-carb population had 14% of their macros limited to carbohydrates. They had 28% as protein and 58% distribution as fat. And then the high-carb, low-fat population had 53% of its intake as carbohydrates, 17% of its intake from protein, whereas the other population of low-carb was 28, and it had 30% of its intake as fat. So those were the macros and a little bit more liberalized than a ketogenic diet, but could be definitely making ketones in that low carb, high fat population. And what we saw in the study was that both populations, because they were hypocaloric or calorie restricted, had successful weight loss. Both of them had success in blood pressure lowering effects, but more participants actually completed the trial in the low carb, high fat because the diet is more sustainable, likely due to the satiety factors. We also saw that in the low carb, high fat population, there was more steady blood sugar levels throughout the day. We also saw that more participants in the low carb, high fat or keto population got off of their diabetic drugs and they did see improvements in lipid outcomes or cholesterol. There was actually a maintenance of HDL, whereas both populations had a reduction in total LDL uh, and both reductions in triglycerides. So overall, what this research study shows us is that a low-carb, high-fat diet can achieve successful sustained weight loss and blood sugar reduction and is a safe tool for diabetics as a way to manage the disease condition and reduce medication. They also assessed for markers of renal disease and there showed to be no adverse renal effects in the two years of doing a low carb, high fat diet. So one of the most fascinating studies that I've ever run into concerning nutrition, health, and diet is a very old study. In fact, the study is almost a hundred years old. It is from 1930, and it's called Prolonged Meat Diets with a Study of Kidney Function and Ketosis. Now, other than Weston A. Price's book, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, another one of the most important books concerning nutrition over the last hundred years would have to be Wilhelm Moore Stephenson's 
the fat of the land. Now he was an Arctic explorer who lived for over nine years on an exclusively meat diet. The medical establishment didn't believe him. They said, you're a damn liar, Wilhelm or Stephenson. He was put under strict observation in this study, along with his partner, another Arctic explorer named Anderson. Stephenson and Anderson were observed eating an all meat diet, an exclusively meat diet, under strict observation in the Bellevue Hospital in New York. And the results were astoundingly boring. You know why? Because there was nothing remarkable. They were in perfectly good health. Their kidney function was perfectly fine. They both lost weight in the beginning of the diet and adapted to it very well after a few days of initial gastrointestinal disturbance, a little bit of diarrhea when they first started the diet. After that, everything was perfectly fine. In fact, one of the participants had their gingivitis clear up on the all meat diet. So this study shows that you can't live on bread alone, but you can live on meat alone. Hey everybody, it's nutritionist Amy Berger and the paper I wanted to talk to you about is this one. It's called Implementing a Low Carbohydrate Ketogenic Diet to Manage Type 2 Diabetes Mellitus. And it's co-authored by four authors, three of whom are physicians, they're MDs, and the fourth is a nutritionist, and they all specialize in low-carbon ketogenic diets. And the reason this paper is so interesting and so important is because they actually wrote it as a guide to other clinicians on how to reduce and eliminate medications for people with type 2 diabetes. Um, you know, it's very rare to non-existent that you come across research where people are talking about how effective a diet is for treating a disease that you can actually completely stop or at the very least reduce medication. You have other papers like this one that's focused solely on medication and they're talking about what to do Start with the one medication. When that's no longer enough, add the second. When that's no longer enough, add the third and the fourth, and then maybe you need insulin. Or you could maybe not need any of that if you do a low carb diet. I'm gonna read one quick quote, they wanna keep this short, but before the discovery of insulin and before the pathophysiology of type two diabetes was known to be related to hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance, the leaders in medicine employed low carbohydrate diets to treat type two diabetes. This is from a textbook written in 1877, quote, there are few diseases which present to the practitioner so clear an indication of what is to be done. A diabetic should exclude all saccharine and farinaceous materials from his diet. Saccharine meaning sweet and sugary, farinaceous meaning floury and starchy. And so these authors explain that the low carb or ketogenic diet is so effective for lowering the blood sugar that in people with type 2 diabetes, insulin injections often have to be stopped on the first day of the diet. Oral hypoglycemic agents, meaning oral medications that lower the blood sugar, can be tapered or reduced. They usually stop them all except metformin, again, on the first day. That's how effective this is. So I think this paper is really cool because it's so rare to come across, you know, clinical evidence and clinical suggestions on the fact that this diet is so effective for treating this illness that you can actually stop medication. Hey, it's Dr. Darren Schmidt. This is my favorite study. It's from Verda Health. It's a clinical study with 400 people over the course of one year in ketosis. This graph here shows their A1C over the course of 12 months. So 7.6% is the beginning of these 400 people. And in the first three months or 10 weeks, actually, there was a St steep decline to 6.5%. And you can see this blue line, which shows continual improvement over the course of the full 12 months. I want to compare this to this study, which was done by Dr. Neil Bernard. It was a study on veganism. Now you can see the A1C started off at an average above 8.0, and there's a dramatic decline over the first 22 weeks, but then it goes up again, and that's a big deal. This is called a U shaped curve. So people got better, then they got worse. So in the long run, they only improved by 0.4% with their A1C over the course of a year and a half. So we don't want to see a U-shaped curve when it comes to a trial and claim that this is a good therapy for the condition that's being tested, which is type 2 diabetes. Getting back to this one from Verda Health, it shows a 1.3% decline in the course of the 12 months. Compare that to just a 0.4% decline for the vegan study. Hey, my name is Seem, and I'm going to talk briefly about how your body's fat-burning pathways change 
when you go on a keto diet and you become keto adapted, the simplistic view of fuel utilization is that your body will burn primarily fat at lower intensities of exercise and at higher levels of exercise, it starts to use more glycogen and glucose. This is known as the crossover effect. Usually it's said that the crossover effect happens at 65% of your VO2 max, where you shift from burning fat into using glycogen and carbs for fuel. In 2016, Jeff Wallach and Stephen Finney did a study called FASTER, which showed that ultra-endurance athletes who had keto adapted for 9 to 36 months showed extraordinarily higher rates of fat oxidation. They were using fat for fuel even at intensities of 70 to 80% of their VO2 max, compared to the 55% of the high-carb control group. Peak fat oxidation was 2 to 3-fold higher in the low-carb group, and it occurred at a higher percentage of VO2 max. Over the course of a 3-hour run at 65% of VO2 max, the low-carb group was burning 30% more fat and 30% fewer carbohydrates than those who ate high-carb. Some of the subjects on the keto diet actually burned 98% fat and only 2% glucose at 65% intensity. Fat burning in this context doesn't mean that you're losing weight or you're losing body fat from the exercise. It simply means what kind of a metabolic pathway your body is going through during that exercise. This study simply refutes the consensus view of the crossover effect and it shows that after you become keto adapted, your body is able to still burn fat as a fuel source even at higher intensities of exercise. The more keto adapted you are, the longer you can stay in the fat burning zone without starting to use glycogen at higher intensities of exercise. Okay guys, hope you enjoyed the video. Those are all the studies, I'm linking them below. Do me a favor though, if you have some information that you think we should all be aware of, link the studies below, not articles, not Washington Post, this is why a keto diet will kill you. Actual studies. Link those below. We'll check those out. Anything that you feel is important. Thanks for watching, guys.